Hi, this is Stacy Chalemi from The Advisor. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. It is April Federico and she is here today. She is just an amazing person. And she has, does, she is, she's kind of dips and dabs. She's into law, but yet she does a lot of stuff in the health and healing area. And she has accomplished so much. And she's here to share her story today with you and talk about various um, conditions and different ways to help the body and to help yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually. So she has a lot of great information. So I'm really excited. I'm going to hand over the plate to April and just let her tell you a little about herself. And so take it away, April, because I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and I'm honored to be on your podcast to share my story. Um, well, my story really um, started on the night I almost died. And that was February 14th, so Valentine's Day, wow. 2022. Um, my pancreas obviously forgot to show me a little love, but don't worry, I got a very nice text from my boyfriend that day. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it was the first day of my very first corporate job. And I noticed I was starting to feel really sick and lightheaded. And I was having really bad acid reflux. And Im immediately what I thought was like, oh my God, I'm getting sick. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Because it was the first day at my job. And of course I had to leave early. Yeah. Which was awful. And, um, but in hindsight, I would have had to be taken away in an ambulance if I had stayed any longer. Wow. Yeah. And immediately when they... Well, not immediately, but when I got to the hospital in North Providence, I, um, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I passed out. Oh, wow. Yeah. I passed out and I was like in and out of a diabetic coma, which I didn't realize until after I finally regained consciousness. Obviously I was touched by some sort of angel. Otherwise, I would have died. Wow. Yeah. And I had doctors, nurses um, basically interrogating me on like, like, April, do you know where you are? And I think at one point I was so disoriented that I said I was at my boyfriend's dad's pool party or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's how disoriented I was because I was still half wow. asleep. Yeah. Um. And what they thought it was at first was COVID because um, when it comes to symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis, which is what I almost succumbed to, um, it, some of the symptoms can be um, mistaken for COVID. Mm -hmm. And, but obviously that wasn't the case when they right. did all these blood, blood samples and so forth. And they found so much, so many ketones in my system. Wow. Yeah. And then I made it a life mission on my near deathbed, so to speak, um, for the next four days I was in the ICU to basically educate and empower the public on the dangers of diabetic ketoacidosis, um, how we can educate our children in, in our school systems, as well as just in general in nutrition because yeah. they don't do this stuff in primary secondary or even medical schools right i mean they don't teach you this stuff in medical school because of the whole stigma uh stigmata that um that you know diabetics give the, give it to themselves and like it's a socioeconomic issue and that's not the case at all right yeah and i wound up um becoming a nutritionist a few months later. Um, they're a really great training program. And I, because I wanted to really apply um, the confidence and resilience I had mm -hmm. to basically optimize my mindset as yeah. well as my illness. Mm -hmm. And this is the birth of the Cicero method. So that's confidence and intelligence create emotional resilience to optimize love it yeah and it's essentially your well-being but really it became a universal concept and what i love about it is that 
I didn't know that I was following it when I was essentially beating diabetes on yeah. my own. And keep in mind that I couldn't see an endocrinologist for two months after my diagnosis. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, he's the top endocrinologist in the country. So Dr. Chang, props to you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, um, I remember just basically educating myself on my own diagnosis because when when I was in the hospital, they basically just gave me a packet and sent me on my way. Yeah. But to what? Yeah. But to what? It's like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what's going to make my blood sugar go up? What's what's going to make it dip? It was basically a whole guessing game for about a month. Yeah. And I was still working in corporate until they finally had to let me go um, two months later because they just couldn't handle all my appointments and being sick 24-7. And you and I were just talking about this yeah. um, whole job discrimination thing, mm -hmm. um, which is something that we also need to educate um, not only corporate leaders, yeah. but also um, laymen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think like one of the biggest problems is that they, they don't even start in the school systems. They don't teach, you know, they don't teach the teachers or the staff what to do if something happens to a child if they have a diabetic attack you know if something happens and if they get a symptom if they if something happens to them they don't you know if someone like myself with epilepsy has a seizure most of these staff members don't know what to do you know there are there are kids with autism that have you know that have certain you know degrees uh, of you know their behavior changes or you know something you know that that, that they can't really absorb well, you know, they get all antsy and the teachers don't know how to handle it. And they do things that actually make the situation worse. You know, teachers, staff members, people in the corporate world, people, they should have classes, they should have education, people coming in and explaining how to handle different illnesses and conditions, you know, because people don't, and what people don't understand, they fear. And when they fear it, they keep it away. And that's the problem. That's when the discrimination comes in. And that's when the myths, the, the, the myths come in and people misunderstand things and they don't realize the importance and they don't even realize how capable these people with illnesses, conditions and disorders, how much they can contribute to society, that they're just like them. They just, you know, in certain ways, they have to take care of themselves a little bit differently, but they're no different than the person next to them. And, you know, that's where the stigmatism comes in. That's where, you know, all these, these issues come in because people are not educated. That's where it all comes down to lack of education, lack of knowledge. And, you know, people, you know, really need to understand the importance and they need to start from the ground up and start educating you know all these people from 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 kindergarten all the way to the corporate world even you know have people come into small businesses and maybe give a small little lecture and just explain so people understand and they know and they can actually work with people and not make people feel uncomfortable because that's a that's a big problem in our United States is the stigmatism, just, you know, labelizing people and then treating people differently when everybody is just like everybody else. You know, they just may do th things a little bit differently, but overall, everyone has special, you know, uh, special unique things about them and special strengths that they can use to contribute to make society a better world. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going into law. And this was not out of like pure indecisiveness, but this was mm -hmm. out of um, a dream I've had since high school. And I've often gotten discriminated based on my anxiety disorder. And I unfortunately suffer from test anxiety, which is a real thing. Yes. However, it does cause me to literally just seize and freeze up during a test or even a quiz right That's how severe it was and it's still severe to this day and i mean i can't even take an assessment without getting anxious right and or at least having a panic attack mm -hmm. and i mean oftentimes i muddle through and people often dismiss it as like oh but you're high functioning and that's not always the case. Like it still affects me. Yeah. And, um. Yeah. I remember this one time after a world literature AP exam, mm -hmm. this 
girl comes up to me and she goes like, oh, you finished some of those questions pretty quickly. I'm like, so? And mm -hmm. this girl also comes up to me and she goes like, oh, don't worry. I finish, I finish um, pretty quickly too. But and the same girl goes, yeah, but you take seconds. April takes like six years. It's like, you got to be kidding me. And this girl knew I had test anxiety. She knew I required extra time on tests. Yeah. Because that was a huge accommodation of mine. And that's where I often got discriminated. Yeah. Um, because I had extra time on tests. Well, in that sense, it, it's more, you know, it's, it's her own personal issues, you know, yeah. her being either jealous or angry because, hey, you're getting this and I can't get that. But she doesn't understand that you're battling something that she's not experiencing, that she has no idea how it feels to have that anxiety and to have panic attacks because of you worked yourself up to a certain point because it's just it's, it's, you know, it's just how you're wired, you know, and it's trying to break that. Now, have you ever been able to overcome some of that anxiety and, and decrease it? And so, so you wouldn't have to go through as much anxiety? Because I know so many people who have test anxiety and get yeah. panic attacks before a test because they get themselves so overworked, even though they have the potential to do well, they get so nervous that what if, oh my God, if I fail this, if I don't do well, if I don't get this grade, and they put such expectations on top of themselves. It's kind of like a, a 500 pound brick on top of them. And then they're trying to push it off and then they're sweating and then they're getting in. That's where the panic attack and then the anxiety comes in. Is there anything that you were able to do to apply to your life to make it easier for yourself? Um. Well, really, it was my own growth mindset that really helped me to overcome it for the lack of a better word mm -hmm. and, um, or phrase for that matter. Yeah. And what I realized was that I have the confidence. I've had the confidence all along. It's like Dorothy with her Ruby slippers. <laughs> it's like, she just puts those on just to feel confident. And yeah. um, little does she know, Linda, the good witch comes along and she says, you had the power all along, my dear. You just had to realize it for yourself. Exactly. Very well put. Yes, very true. And, you know, what type of mindset did you install on yourself? Because I think that's important for listeners to understand is like, what type of mindset do you need in order to be able to move forward and not let some of the, the things that go on in our lives pull us back or keep us stuck in places we don't want to be? Yeah, well, it really depends on the situation. I mean, if you're dealing with um, someone like the girl I was mentioning, or even um, even a parent, mm -hmm. um, or a professor, or anything like that, any authority figure, you have to realize that um, when they make certain comments um, like, like that, um, you have to realize that it's not on you it's on them. Yes. If they don't like your confidence, that's on them. Yep. Otherwise they can just like, you know, F yeah. off, something mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's usually them with the issues. It's not the person with the issues. It's always them. They have the issues inside, you know, whatever the issues may be, it's always, you know, their, their negative reactions or the things they say, or their bullying actions, you know, oh, it's always because of issues that they have within themselves. And, you know, it makes them feel a sense of power or the sense of, you know, belittling somebody else makes them feel better. You know, it makes them feel like they're worthy in their own head when it actually is the opposite. Exactly. And I went to school with so many girls who, girls and even boys who, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, who've like always walked like they own the place, but really they're just putting down people left and right. Yeah. And really, what good does that do you? Exactly. I mean, other than like gain a few friends, maybe out of just, out of just sheer ignorance. Right. And this is, this goes back to what I was saying. Like if they want to be ignorant, yeah. again, it's on them. And I mean, that, I mean, what like kind of friends are they really problem. getting, you know? Yeah, Exactly. And um, I'm like, ignorance is not bliss. Mm -mm. I hate to tell you, it's not bliss. <laughs> no, it's not. Not at all. Not at all. 
And then usually they're the pe we track the same energy. So if they're attracting people like themselves, they're going through the same issues themselves, you know, and they just need to feel wanted or they need to feel a part of something. So it's, you know, like you said, it's not bliss at all. You know, these are people who are lacking things in their life, you know, whether it's at home, whether it's mentally things going on in their cells, you know, but they're lacking now I really like to talk about your health because you you are so into health and you're you you know you were talking about how important it is you know for your mind your body your, your soul everything to be connected and how to keep it healthy and I want to learn more about that program you're talking about that you devise that you teach. Yes, so what I teach is an intuitive eating program, and I actually have a. 10 week program that I'm starting in February of 2024, which you can apply via the show notes that Stacy will have. Mm -hmm. And um, what I teach in that program is basically the mind body connection and basically the importance of mindful eating, mindful nutrition, and really just being mindful in general. Right. It's really, it all comes down to the it's like what you were saying earlier, Stacey, um, with the spine. Um, if one thing is out of whack, then the whole system is going to collapse. Mm -hmm. And and really, when you have this un unhealthy relationship with food, and this is what most of my clients probably will have, is right. an unhealthy relationship with food, and thusly leading them down to these rabbit holes of fad diets, the wellness trap. And, um, and other things like fake news when it comes to nutrition. Yeah. And, and really it just, it all starts on what you consume. Yeah. And it starts and really the whole concept of you, you are what you eat and you are what you consume mm -hmm. is real, no matter yeah. if it's social media or no matter if it's, um, what you're physically putting in your body. Mm-hmm. And you also are what you do to your body. Yes. So these fad diets, I'm going to completely rid you of those. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know they exist. I've tried them. I'm guilty of Googling like how to get JLo's butt. <laughs> and, like how to get Cameron Diaz's legs. Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. When I was in eighth grade. Um, in just eighth grade. Yeah. Like yeah. think about that for a second. Like, <laughs> body um dis body dysmorphia actually starts um as early as the age of six. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, yeah. And those can actually carry on um through generations. Mm -hmm. Like if your grandmother says something, then your mom would probably say it, yeah. and then and then if you say it to your daughter, then your daughter could potentially just break the cycle of this generational um what do you call it um toxicity mm -hmm. when it comes to um eating eating foods that you enjoy or looking a certain way or maybe even things like alcoholism or even um I mean I can't guarantee um you'll get rid of alcoholism but I can guarantee that you will have the new mindset to enjoy the foods that you want right and I can guarantee that you will have the mindset to pursue anything that you always wanted with this new intuitive eating mindset. I love it. You know, I think it's so important. Like people don't realize that, you know, our mind is so powerful. Like we were talking about before, it's such a powerful tool and um, that's why a lot of times when you see people, elders, they get to a certain age and they lose a spouse you know, a lot of times in research, you know, six months later, the other spouse will pass, you know, and it's, it's the minds that the, the will to want to hold on the will to fight to the will to be healthy, you know, 70% of, of uh, illness is caused by stress. So yeah. how we, how we perceive stress, how we think, how we react plays a, a huge role on our immunity. And when we break the walls down our, to our immunity system, we're basically opening the doors to anything, you know, to come in and, and make themselves at home. And that's when the illnesses could start to evolve. And so many things are related to stress, you know, so many illnesses. 
And then when we put those foods in our mouths and we, if our body doesn't recognize it and doesn't know what to do with it, it stores it. And then all well, you have all these toxins starting to build up all these chemicals, all these ingredients, you know, people don't even look at the back of the labels. A lot of people, they just buy something and they don't realize what they're putting in their system. Well, neither is your body. If it doesn't recognize it, it's going to store it. And before you know it, all your organs are going to get sluggish. You might mm -hmm. start thinking foggy. You might not be able to think clear. You might yeah. be getting symptoms, you know, and different things happening to you. And then mm -hmm. sadly, I, I see so many people run to doctors and they give them medication and then they get symptoms from the medication. And then they run back to the doctor and say, now I'm feeling this way. And the doctor gives them a new prescription. And before you know it, they have a pantry of medication. They're still not feeling good. And they're still doing the behaviors that are causing them the problems in the first place. And they're not getting better. They're only getting worse. Exactly. And I hate to say this, but I am one of those people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not like in a physical sense, but in a psychiatric sense. Yeah, yeah. Because like you said, um, and you were totally right about this, like all of like basically all of your illness, all of, all illnesses come from stress. Mm -hmm. And I was I was one of those girls who would like um, preach gut health and I still do. But um, gut health has become more of a phenomenon where we have um where it seems like we don't have autonomy over our bodies mm -hmm. based on like what um new things are coming in from the food industry and based on what things are coming in um from the FDA and so on and so right. forth i think yeah. what people don't realize with gut health is that it's it you know when it comes to the gut a lot of things do happen and formulate in the gut but you can't just take a powder or a pill and then think that your gut is going to be brand new. It's a lifestyle change. It's, you know, how you eat, how you sleep, how you think, you know, how, your, how to handle stress. It's a whole thing, you know, and it's, it's basically, I think in, like with anything, it's, it's a combination of things all blended together and that, that help people get better. You know, just like you were talking about that program, it's, it's a bunch of different components that you have to apply in order to get that satisfactory feeling, you mm -hmm. know, of what you're looking for at the end of the rainbow. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah. I think that's where people misled. They think, okay, I'll take this and then I'll feel better, but they don't realize that, okay, what are you going to be eating? Are you going to incorporate any exercise into your diet? Are mm -hmm. you going to, you know, are you going to be getting the, the seven or eight hours of sleep that you're supposed to be getting? How are you handling your stress? You know, and these are all things people have to keep in mind. Exactly. And what people don't understand about diabetes is that, you, do, you don't just take like a shot of insulin mm -hmm. and um, yeah, you don't just take a shot of insulin and then expect to be better right away. Like yeah. you have to control it with diet mm -hmm. and you also have to control it with um, exercise. Yes. Right now I'm on the pill Jardians. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize at first was that I needed to not go back to my old habits. Yeah. I needed to keep going with my new habits that I developed when I was first diagnosed. Yeah. You know, what's so scary is that in the United States, diabetes has tripled, you know, yes. over the course. And so that tells you, you know, how people are eating and how people are taking care of their bodies. Now, some people are genetically inclined to get diabetes, you know, that, you know, we have, we have two different types of diabetes, but then they have people that get diabetes because of their diet and how they take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are born with diabetes or they get diabetes as a, as a young child and it's genetically in their genes, but you still can do things to help yourself, you know, and it's not, mm -hmm. You have to treat yourself, you know, and you have to take care of yourself. It's a, it's a daily lifestyle change. You know, I don't want to say like, I don't, I never like to use the word diet. I kind of, I say lifestyle change, but you have to change the way you eat the way, like you said, you need some exercise. I've mm -hmm. seen, I've seen people get their, their numbers back to normal just by changing the way they eat. They take their pill, they exercise a little bit and nothing strenuous. I see people like exercise for 15 minutes a day on the treadmill, but they're eating really good. They're taking care of themselves and their numbers go back, you know, to, to normal or pretty close to it, you know, where they're, they're on in the, in the safe zone. 
And, you know, and then I had people like my grandmother who used to hide Charlie, Charlie Chew, uh, Chew bars that were like this long in her, in her, uh, in her, uh, in her closet. So nobody would see them. And when no one was looking, she would eat them, you know, and she had diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really how you have to take it seriously. Cause you know, and then for my grandmother, it was in her early seventies, she lost her eyesight from diabetes. You know, diabetes is a serious, serious condition that people have to really, if they're diagnosed with it, they have to take it seriously. And we had one doctor from Harvard come on and he talked about how, you know, our world is all processed foods, people, you know, processed rice, processed grains, all these foods are, you know, contributing to the diabetes. He said, you know, he, you know, he firmly believed, you know, a lot of the food we eat are not natural and, you know, and it's true. And cause like when I went to Europe in the United, half the, more than half the food was banded. You couldn't find most of the food that we have in the United States in Europe because mm -hmm. they didn't allow it. It went against their their regulations, but yet we sell them here. And then people, you know, all these foods have tons and tons of sugar in them, you know, and it it's just it's destroying people. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. Like everything seems to be processed and it's not just food. Yeah. The stuff it's like what I was saying earlier, it's the stuff you consume. Mm -hmm. Not just with your mouth, but with your eyes, your yeah. ears, it's mm -hmm. your family life. It's the primary food is what they call it. Yeah. Which is essentially the foundation of your lifestyle, which could, which could be anything from your home to your mental health, to your spiritual health, to your physical health. Yeah. Can you tell people a little more in depth about your program? Because it sounds really interesting. Like what, what is it all about? Like what are the different stages? What do they consist of? And then at the end, when you're, when you apply all these things to your life, what most likely will happen to you? Like what kind of changes will you see in yourself if you, if you take it seriously and you do what you're supposed to? Yes. So first I want to say that intuitive eating is a mindful approach to eating that focuses on listening to your body's cues and building a healthy relationship with food. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that intuitive eating is a personal journey. So you will get one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching with me in consultations. Mm -hmm. And then we will eventually meet as a group. Yeah. And um, just basically discuss everything um, that we've been through, all the transformations that we've gone through for, from this 10, this 10 week program. And um, so session one will be understanding intuitive eating, which is where we will discuss the principles of intuitive eating mm -hmm. and explore the benefits of intuitive eating for physical and mental well being. Right. And building awareness, which is in week two, guiding clients to identify and reflect on their current eating habits right. and introducing the concept of the hunger and fullness scale. Okay. And then um, weeks three and four will be the mindful eating practices. Okay. Because we do want to tread lightly when it comes to this program. Yeah. And so this is where I'll be teaching mindful eating techniques like savoring, chewing slowly, and paying attention to sensory experiences. Mm -hmm. And then encouraging clients to practice mindful eating during one meal each, each day. Right. And then session four is identifying emotional hunger. So we will be discussing emotional eating yeah. and how to differentiate between emotional and physical hunger. Right. And then introducing coping mechanisms for emotional triggers without resorting to food. Yeah. And then weeks five and six, we will be rejecting the diet mentality. Mm. This is where we completely ditch the diet talk. The whole anti-diet thing starts then. Yeah. And if you're looking for something like that, then this is the program for you. So we will be exploring the negative effects of dieting on mental and physical health, helping clients identify and challenge diet related thoughts and beliefs mm -hmm. and discussing the impact of body image right. on well-being and introducing self-compassion practices and strategies to improve body acceptance um, then we go to building healthier habits, 
um, based on our own personal needs. And then finally, weeks nine and 10, we will be talking about sustaining intuitive eating as well as putting that into practice. That sounds great. Now, this seems like it could help people with food addiction also. Absolutely. Because that's that's a big issue. That's a very, you know, I know I, I, we have so many listeners who are interested in how to overcome food addiction because so many people are emotional, either emotionally addicted to food because they just love the taste or they mm -hmm. are emotional eaters where, you know, some people might go to drugs to, or alcohol to <laughs> deal with their problems and some people resort to food and it's just a comfort zone and it's breaking down, you know, find that alternate, alternate, you know, how to deal with those emotions and not resort to food as your, your comfort zone. Exactly. And what people don't realize is that there are other ways of coping and they just haven't found them yet. Yeah. And this is what I will definitely go into depth on in these 10 weeks that we will have together. Mm -hmm. And it will be based on your needs as opposed to other people's needs. So I it's... mean, we will, we will have like group calls where we will like bounce ideas off each other. Um, but really, it's all about what's best for you. So it's, it seems like it's more personalized for each individual kind of, because, yes. so that's very important, I think, because, it, you know, sometimes you'll see people, they'll give standard programs, but really every individual reacts differently. So it's really important to customize things. You could have the, the program, the same program, but if it's customized to put that individual's needs, I think it's so much more effective. Exactly. And I am definitely um, someone who doesn't believe in a one size fits all approach. Right. Because I know that that does not work in yeah. terms of diet programs. Right. right. I mean, I've tried doing that in the past. Then I realized like, you know, group coaching is not exactly for me. Yeah. I mean, it may be good for other niches. However, when it comes to nutrition specifically, like you have to have a personalized approach. Right. Right. I think, I think that's most important because like, you know, everybody is so different, you know, and everybody, you know, what works for one person may not work for the other person. And it's when you have a customized approach and you're work, you know, I think it, it is so much more effective, you know, mm -hmm. and it, and people could actually figure out why they're doing what they're doing. I know for me personally, I could be good the whole day and then for some reason, I get those cravings at night. I don't know if it's because I'm sitting in front of the TV. I don't know if my body's just triggered or if it's just a a, a sense of ha bad habits. That's where I'll find myself starting to want to munch on things is late at night. So here I am good all day long. And right at nighttime, the, when you're not supposed to be eating is a time where I always tend to screw up because of that craving that, you know, and I don't know if it's psychologically or if it's just being used to a bad habit, or if it's just because at nighttime, many people, you know, cause I hear a lot of people tend to crave, you know, that you were just sitting there. We're not occupying our minds and we're just watching TV and we, we want something to do something and we're just throwing food in our mouth, popcorn, whatever the case may be you know, and we find ourselves jeopardizing our goals. Yeah. And you actually bring up something that's really important here. And that is the um, unfortunate power of restriction. Mm -hmm. And if you say like you're good all day, and if you are, even if you are good all day, you still don't want to deprive yourself of the foods that you love. Right. Like, take, for example, the holiday season. Yeah. Like, I honored my fullness at one point um, and I wanted, I really wanted a cookie. Mm -hmm. So I let myself have the cookie. Yeah. And I mean, I was, it was a healthy lunch. It was swordfish and it was really good. Right. Um, however, I did not want to completely deprive myself of the foods that I really wanted. Yeah. Because, um. And the holidays really aren't a time where you can just say like, okay, it's the holidays. I can now finally eat whatever I want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that should be the case like year round. And this is what people get wrong about intuitive eating coaches mm -hmm. is that they tend to misinterpret the fact that we don't, um, like we're not telling people to eat like crap 24-7. Right, telling people to just savor the foods 
when we can. Yeah. And when we want. Right. And I noticed too, like, I think you could have foods, you know, you could, you could treat yourself to little things every once in a while. You don't have to, like you said, starve yourself and, and then, you know, and, and not be able to enjoy the foods that you really like, but we all, you know, if you keep it in your head too, I think quantity matters, you know, instead, instead of having like 15 cookies, have one or two, you know, like, you know, be, try to be sensible about it. And I like how you say chew slowly because so many people just gobble their food down in two seconds mm -hmm. and you don't feel first, you don't savor the, the food. You don't get that full satisfaction effect. And two, you don't really know when you're full because if you eat slowly, a lot of times your body say, like, okay, I had enough. But if you're gobbling oh. the food down, you're eating these large quantities of food and your body is already full, but you haven't recognized that fullness effect because you haven't given your body time enough to digest it and let you know, hey, I'm full, stay, don't eat anymore, you know? <laughs> and that's, I think, one of the biggest things in our, in our states. I see so many people, they could clear a plate in three seconds and it's like, I'm still eating my carrot and I'm looking over and that person's dish is already almost gone. I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and not going to lie. I used to be that person who would like gobble their food up in seconds. Right. Right. And really it was just a way of me saying like, okay, this is like something I can have like once in a while. Right. And I should probably just enjoy this now. And really I'm not enjoying it. Like I'm just like gobbling it up. Like, yeah, savoring. I'm po possibly savoring the moment. Yeah. I could have it. However, I'm not like actually tasting the food itself. And that's what people tend to miss out on. Yeah, very true. And what I noticed too, is that once you get onto the, you learn how to, the program, like, like you're, you're teaching with intuitive eating, when you start nixing a lot of the junk out and a lot of the sugar out, you tend not to crave it anymore. You know, you go through like an addiction stage where you feel like you're, it's hard to get off sugar. I have to say, like I, I cut sugar out of my diet. Like I, I would, you know, I, I, I was drinking black coffee. If I had a cup of coffee, instead of putting sugar in my coffee, anything that would extra sugar, you know, I, I made sure like when I bought food, it had like hardly any sugar in it. You know, I, it was natural sugar if it had sugar in it. And it was like, I was very cautious, but getting off of the sugar was really, really hard and it's like your body goes through a withdrawal but then after a while when you do taste the sugar you don't really like it as much anymore like now yeah. if i eat something sweet i'm like oh it's too sweet for me you know and exactly. it's like, so i think when you start to eat healthy you lose the, the cravings for a lot of foods you also you always have those little cravings for those favorite foods you never want to give up but there are a lot of stuff that you no longer have an interest in once you start eating healthy yeah. And that was me with, um, you know, processed cereals and even like even coffee. Yeah. I don't drink coffee anymore. And like, I'm trying to wean off espresso. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. But, um, yeah. you know what? You just got to train your brain to do it. Right. I noticed when I started drinking matcha tea and mm -hmm. that was healthy green beans instead of coffee beans that um, I started to lose my craving for coffee when I started to drink the matcha tea. Yeah. And so it was like, I used that as a, a healthier alternative. And then after a while, when I drank a cup of coffee, I didn't like the taste as much anymore. I was like, I wasn't, I didn't have that, that, that urge anymore to want to drink coffee. Like I did before, like maybe one cup of coffee in the morning was like more than enough. And most of the time I, I find that I don't even, I don't, I don't even finish the cup, you know, and it's just, right. you know, you just change sometimes I think if you change things and you alter things in your diet you know you could have somewhat of the same satisfaction but then it you kind of you can slowly nix those bad things out too how do you feel about that yeah I mean when you start to mix out the or like strain out the bad things that's when you can um excuse me stuffy nose um um that's when you can really start to put everything into practice. Yeah. And that's when you can start to really train your mindset and have this mindset about food that you actually always wanted to acquire. Right. Do you like to, um, do you believe in food journals? Is that one way of, of doing things? Like, are there any techniques and tools that you use to help you when you're, when you were in the process of learning how to, to eat properly and intuitive eating? 
Um, well, not so much intuitive eating, but I do um keep my own. And this is a journal that I authored. And it was Ah, nice. uh, it's the diabetic um food journal, so to speak. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I also have this um Be Well by April uh food journal in and of itself. Oh, wow. And um yeah, so these are two different books here or journals, I should say. And um, the Be Well by April um, food journal actually just tracks what you eat for food and how you feel afterwards. And then the diabetic food journal is um, the is is one in which you can assess like what will make your blood sugar dip, what will make your blood sugar go up. Right. I like Yeah. that. Yeah, so that's one way to track your food um, when you have a, a situation that was similar to mine. Right, right. Now, have you you authored two books? Did you offer any any other books besides the two? Oh, yes. Um, I do have a diabetic-friendly cookbook. Nice. I also have um, a supplementary title to the cookbook called Making Your Diet Manageable. I like that. Yeah. Because I think it's great when people have recipes and, you know, they they're, they need to learn how to cook or eat better. And it's so much easier, I think, sometimes when you have a, a guide, you know, and you see recipes and you can and and they're easy recipes you can go by. You're starting to learn how to eat healthier. You're learning new new things. You're tasting new foods. It makes it makes eating healthy and 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 being able to help control your diabetes, you know, easier. And it's a lot of times those, you know, I, my father who is diabetic, a lot of times, like I'll start to eat some of his foods because it's actually has no sugar in it. And some of his foods I like better than the, sh the ones that are on the shelf that I used to buy, you know, long or buy because, you know, it's, uh, you know, cause it's healthier. It, it has no sugar in it. And it's actually, you know, it's better for your body. And I think even like a diabetic cookbook, you know, it's, it's, it's geared to the audience of diabetics, but sometimes, you know, really you don't have to gear it to the people with diabetes, because if you cut out sugar out of your diet, I have a friend who lost 70 pounds by cutting out sugar out of her diet. So that tells you how toxic sugar is and how, how big of an impact it could have on your health. Even when you're trying to lose weight, not only could it help you with diabetes, but it could help you with weight losses also. Because when you have high sugar levels, you're you're storing fat, and you know, so it goes both ways, you know. Exactly. And here's the thing, like the diabetic diet really is for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's just like you said, um, with your friend, um, like she lost 70 pounds, like just from cutting sugar out of her diet. But um, here's the thing. Can you ever really avoid sugar? No. No. I mean, there are things with natural sugar, Mm -hmm. but it's the added sugar you want to be aware of. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what people are misguided sometimes too. They, and, and even some, if you look in the food stores, the label of they, the labels they put on are very tricky. No added, you know, they'll put like no, no added sugar, but they have sugar already in it, but they're not, they're not adding any more additional sugar. So basically when it says no added sugar, when people read that really quickly and they're not really aware, they're thinking, oh, no added sugar. Oh, no sugar, you know, but they're not, they're not really thinking and they're not looking at the label. So they don't realize that it already has tons of sugar in it. They're not just, they're just not adding any extra sugar to that sugar. So, you know, you have to be so careful. And even sometimes with fruit juice, you know, like there's a lot of, um, you know, you see a lot of um, healthy uh, vegetable juices out there, cranberry juices, this and this and this and this, you know, um, all these different health, healthy blends of, Uh, vegetable juices and red juices, but then you have to be careful because you have to look in the back and you have to look at the sugar level because some of those have such high content of sugar. You have to really, you know, I would say try to buy organic and try to, and look at the sugar level, you know, make sure it, because some of those are just like blurring with sugar. People don't realize how much sugar they're incorporating and they think they're eating healthy, but they're really not. Exactly. And one of the beauties of my diabetic food journal is that I actually teach you how to read a food label carefully and correctly. Mm hmm. That's important. That's Mm-hmm. very important. I think that's what a lot of people lack is that they don't read the labels or sometimes they read the labels. And I always say, if you can't pronounce the word, then obviously it's not good for you.
And then you should yeah, stay away from the product. If you can't pronounce it, then your body won't be able to either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, that it's like, you know, you might not know a lot about health or supplements or this or that, but if you can't say the word, don't use it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. obviously it's not good for you if you can't pronounce the word, you know? So, you know, that was always like a little tip. Now, if you had to give away some takeaways, like, you know, for our listeners, what are some important factors you really like to really have the listeners understand from everything that we talked about today, maybe some three or four important takeaways that you'd like to mention? Sure. Well, one takeaway that I always, um, tell people when I'm on podcasts is to never wait to get tested. And by that, I mean, get your blood tested. Yes. Because I unfortunately caught my, caught my diabetes a little too, too late. Mm -hmm. And resultantly I almost died. Right. And then my second takeaway would be to, um, obviously, um, if you can't pronounce the ingredient, your body won't be able to either. Right. And then the third takeaway would be to um, really savor um, not only your food, but also what you can do as a person, because really it's all about the mindset and the mindset is where all dreams that you have just spew out. In yeah. fact, there's this really great quote by Henry Ford and it's, it's, um, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right because your belief system shapes whatever you're capable of. Right. I like that. I like yeah. that. He's actually, he's given a lot of really good quotes. I, I actually like a lot of the quotes that he's given over the course of his lifetime. Um, he had a lot of really good, good um, quotes. You know, if you ever, if any, any of the listeners ever want to look up Henry Ford, he has a lot of good quotes that he, people have, have uh, quoted from him because he had a, a lot of really intuitive uh, ideas that he expressed in very simplistic ways that actually were really, really uh, helpful and kind of made you see things in a different light. Exactly. And I think, and I think that was like the whole point of this podcast was to be able to see, um, health in a different light. Yeah. Definitely. And to be able to see anything that you can do in a different light. A hundred percent. Now, where can people find your books? Yes. Um, you can find them on Amazon. Okay. Perfect. Amazon only. So. And what's your website address? So everybody has it. So I don't have a set website yet. In fact, okay. And, and, I, and actually I'm still working on it. All uh, right. You can find me on Instagram at the April Federico or at in the pink dot coaching. Oh, nice. Okay. So that I will put that in the description for people so they can contact you. Absolutely. And, yeah, definitely. Definitely. This has been amazing. I am very excited. And, and your, um, your course, if people are interested in your course, how, do they contact you through Instagram about your course? Is there somewhere they can go for that course? Yes, actually, there is a um, Google form, which I believe you'll put in the show notes yeah. where you can apply to work with me. And um, you give me your ad, your um, email address, uh, phone number, um, just answer a couple questions for me and um, we can take it from there. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. I love it. And those Google forms, um, can they also find them on any of the social media? We're going to put it on our podcast, but if um, if anybody um, else is interested, do you just keep it on, you mention it on the podcast or do you have it listed on your Instagram or anything like that? I do have it listed on my Instagram. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So people could also go on Instagram if they refer you, they could just, you know, mention your Instagram and then they can go onto Instagram also. Excellent. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. This has been amazing. You know, I, I hope you'll come back on the show and we can talk more in depth about different areas of health and talk about diabetes. And I, I think it's so important because diabetes has become such a hot topic because so many people have it. And so mm -hmm. many people, you know, so many people are pre-diabetic also. And, you know, and a lot of times, you know, like I personally go for 
my aunt, I go for, you know, blood tests several times a year. And mm -hmm. so I'm always on top of how I feel, but not everyone does that. But a lot of people are pre-diabetic on the borderline, you know, and they don't even know it, you know, and they don't, they don't know what signs to look for. And then they find out, you know, and that, you know, that's when they don't know what to do. And it's people like you that could gear them in the right direction between your program and your books. They could actually get their uh, diabetes either under control or they can get their prediabetes, the numbers lower, so they aren't diabetic, you know? Exactly. So it's very important because like we mentioned earlier, diabetes is something you don't want to play around with because it's one of those diseases that not just attacks one part of the body, it attacks all parts of the body. So mm -hmm. it's very important to, you know, really take it seriously and really change that mindset and change your way of living and be able to incorporate small little tweaks that April's going to teach you that could actually in the long run, save your life and make you live life in a more healthier and productive way. So mm -hmm. April, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been amazing. And I thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. You too.